Bye. Because some of you have been around a very long time around the vaccine world. All right, it's 12 o'clock, so I'm going to get started. So my name is Rebecca Nevidale, and I'm with TAPI, your vaccine coalition in Arizona. Um, we are, today's May 19th, 2022. If you're watching a recording of this, some of it may be out of date, especially if it has anything to do with uh, the pandemic that we are currently in. So be sure to check whyimmunize.org, our website, or CDC's website for any of, for like the most up to date information. Uh, we are still kind of coming down off of cloud nine um, for our annual awards ceremony, uh, where we celebrated all of you and all of the uh, social service professionals, public health professionals, EMS folks who do things every day to keep herd immunity and protect our community um, from disease. If you attended our award ceremony, you would have received an email with an evaluation. We're gonna put that evaluation in the chat or you can scan this QR code. We, it, we The format was a little bit different. So we just wanted to kind of check in to see if you liked it more, if you liked it less. So please feel free to uh, take that evaluation if you already if you went to the event. And for those of you who don't know, uh, we do this best practices and brightest stars award ceremony every year, and we highlight all of the practices that have reached ninety percent coverage for their two year olds, and ninety percent coverage for their teens. I mean, or, and or you can do a toddler award, or you can apply for a teen award, or you can apply for both. It is so inspirational to see all of you get up on stage and accept your awards because we just we know it takes all year and for many of you it takes years and years to be able to get your data the right way get your patients in get all your ma's on the same page everybody doing the same thing um and our favorite part of the tips of, of the of these dinners and award ceremonies is that it's not about the doctors um, it really is about the team and what it takes for a team to get those huge coverage numbers. So congratulations to all of you who received awards um, and all of you who tried to go through the process of pulling your data and you fell just short. We are really excited to partner with you over the next year to make sure that you can get it um, in future years. So 90% coverage is just incredibly, incredibly uh, difficult to get. So, um, and one person you did not see is Tappy's new interim executive director. He could not make our award ceremony, but he is logging on today to say hi. And some of you, I think many of you will, uh, you'll, he'll start talking and you'll be like, I've heard that voice before. Uh, especially if you live in Maricopa or Pima County. So Dr. Bob, why don't you just say hello? Hey there. Um, thanks for having me on this. This is the part of the spiel. Uh, do you, you could also tell them why I wasn't there. It's not a secret. Well, uh, well I don't I don't typically share people's health information. Okay, okay. So <laughs> so the, the event. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wasn't listening. I got in trouble for sidebar so, talks. So the morning of the freaking event, I tested positive for COVID. So there you go. Um, along with so many others of us. Um, so I was, I was bummed to miss it, but um, uh, I understand it went really well. Um, and you all deserved all the awards that you got. Um, I have, this is the part of the spiel where somebody says thank you, of course, um, but I'm seriously really wanna thank you all for, especially for what you've been through the past couple of years. Um, 
a lot of us have suffered very real moral injury from what we've been through with COVID. And I know many of you had patients refuse your life-saving vaccine for reasons that didn't make sense to you at the time. I know some of you have been uh, accused by your own patients of being part of some bizarre conspiracy or another. Um, many of us have lost people um, or had people we care about really suffer um, when we have good reason to think it didn't have to happen. Um, and I, I just applaud you for hanging in there and still being part of this. It's only going to get tougher. Uh, vaccine hesitancy of all sorts, it continues. Um, it's March upward. Um, policies are being put in place at various levels of government to make what we do harder. Um, so I'm just so grateful for what you continue to do and um, what you do is going to be more important than ever as we continue to go forward with this. Okay. Um, Rebecca, why don't you give me, or whoever's moving the slides, move one along. All right. Go to the next slide. We're going to talk about some issues here. Um, first of all, where are we with COVID right now? I hate to tell you this, guys, um, but we're on the upswing. Now, there is always been uh, an undercount in the number of cases we counted because um, of all the people who were asymptomatic or had really mild symptoms and never got tested. But now that's more pronounced than ever because the, a lot of the testing, probably the vast majority of testing that's getting done are with those at-home test kits that aren't necessarily getting reported anywhere. So this is a big undercount. Um, and we, despite that, we are definitely on the way up. Um, why, what's going on? Um, go to the next slide. Um, how much is, or how much risk there is in a community because of that undercount now? You, we can't look at it the same way we did before. Um, it's not just numbers of cases out there. So every local community, every county, at least in Arizona, is looking at its own data um, to set a community level of uh, risk for COVID. And that combines the case count, like we just talked about, but also um, how many hospital admissions are occurring for COVID and what fraction of the beds that are, are being occupied in hospitals um, by people with COVID. Um, and when you add those things together, right now, every county in Arizona is at a low community level for COVID-19. Um, why? Even though our cases are gradually beginning to pick up, um, things are changing with the virus. Um, as you know, there are new variants that continue to uh, occur over time. There is the BA2 variant and now a sub variant of BA2 with lots of dots and numbers <laughs> after the name. And there will be others that come along too. When a new variant is on the increase, by definition, that means it's either more transmissible than what it's replacing, or it's perhaps um, found some way to get around some of the um, uh, immune protection that we all have, either from vaccine and or getting infected with one of the other variants that occurred earlier. Um, so expect that to continue to change. Um, uh, let's, um, as that continues to change, um, what, that, what that means is that you will see as we go forth from here on with COVID with some increase, some decrease. Um, I don't think we're gonna see another surge 
like we did January and February of this year, that was just so enormous. Um, but you will see COVID around and the level it's at right now is nothing. You know, you see society just saying, hallelujah, this is over. We're out of the pandemic phase. We can go back to life as usual. Not really. Um, we're still, we're losing an average right now of about four people a day um, in Arizona. Um, that's a rate of infection that you'd expect, you know, middle of your flu season from flu, for example. If we're at a relatively low rate and we're losing four people a day, um, that means that over the course of the year, because this is probably going to be around all the time at some level, our regular endemic phase of COVID is going to be worse than we almost ever see for the flu. Um, and so just be prepared in your offices, even though the community level of transmission is low, keep the masks on, keep the masks on your patients. There's no guidelines that says it's time to take off masks in, in healthcare settings. So keep that, um, keep that going. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, kids and booster doses, but I'm going to ask Macrina to help weigh in on some of this too. Right now, as we speak, ASEP, the Advisory, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, is meeting discussing booster doses for five and up. Um, and there will be early next month uh, meetings of the FDA advisory committee followed again by ASIP um, regarding vaccines for the littlest um, ones. So uh, things will continue to change. Um, guidelines will continue to change. COVID's here to stay and what you do to, to uh, um, get as much vaccine of all sorts into as many arms as possible is more important than ever. Macrina, you have anything to add on boosters? Um, I just checked, there's nothing official. The ACIP is meeting today and will give us the official word. So it's one of those things that probably before we're done here today, there'll be a recommendation for boosters for those five to 11 year olds. And you guys have no idea what an important role you play in getting those boosters into kiddos because they trust you. You're the ones who've been immunizing their kiddos from day one. Um, you're the ones who they feel safe asking questions of. You're the ones who've been getting those vaccines, the thing we're gonna talk about later today, later in this presentation. So, um, so please, things are gonna get a little bit more difficult before they get better, but you guys have been facing this all along. And they're the ones calling them in for back to school. So don't forget, you can co-administer this vaccine with any other right. vaccine. Right. Yeah. Right. Actually, this timing may not be too bad because you may actually get some of those kiddos who wait till the last minute, the first day of school. You might be able to catch some of those kiddos in there a little bit earlier and get those back to school uh, boosters in and those immunizations the same time you get the COVID booster. Mm -hmm. So we have boosters for five plus we expect will start soon. What's, what's going on with under five? We still haven't heard anything. Um, the data has been for um, Moderna has been submitted to FDA on the under fives. Mm -hmm. uh, Pfizer is coming soon. Um, the FDA advisory committee meets um, June 6th and 7th, I believe. Um, and uh, a, the advisory committee on immunization practices, the CDC's advisory committee, will take that recommendation and meet themselves, and they have to recommend the vaccine before you're going to see it available. Um, so hmm. sometime in June, perhaps, um, if we're lucky, then we'll be able to add those kids. Again, which will be good for, you know, um, child care, vaccine visits and such to be able to add that to the littlest ones. And this is really important information to remember when your parents ask about the COVID and the safety is that this is following the same process that we follow with all the other vaccines 
that children have been receiving for years. Nothing's been skipped. Um, the ACIP will review the data and then make the recommendations. So, so it's just to kind of summarize Dr. Bob, it's been a hell of a few years. Um, he knows it, we know it, we've all been kind of living through it. Um, but I think that vaccines have provided our glimmer of hope. I mean, when if you think back to um, hey. us all glued to those screen when that when those UPS trucks came with that vaccine, we were all crying. Um, uh, li listen, you all out there who've given a bunch of this have saved a lot of lives. Millions, Period. yeah, millions Period. of lives, yeah. And as much as we may be saddened that um, we didn't do as well as we should have as a nation and as a state with this, um, don't discount mm -hmm. how much was done. I mean, my God, that, that we had such good vaccine so fast um, is just amazing. And it continues to work. Um, in January, during the height of the uh, Omicron uh, variant, people who hadn't gotten any COVID vaccine compared to people who'd been vaxxed and got at least one, and got one booster dose of vaccine um, were 180 times more likely to die. 108 in Arizona, 180 times. That's how much protection you're offering people. So there you go. That's that. Those are great. Now, we're curious to hear from you. There's a poll that just popped up on your screen about who you're offering vaccine to or who you're planning to when under five comes. Um, uh, for a couple different reasons, we're interested in this, but we know that because we've talked to a lot of pediatric providers, especially that because you can't do your whole population, you know, whole population, you're just kind of waiting for those babies. So we're going to start asking these kinds of questions of you a little bit more frequently so we can just get a little bit of a temperature check. And I will keep this open for just a couple more seconds. And I'll tell you, it looks like most pe people are doing five plus. About a third of you are planning, it looks like so far, to do under five. That is awesome. I just yeah. have to say that that that's great. I I would have been seriously worried about um, participation with the littlest with the well, youngest. Well, and a lot of folks that log on here, um, Doctor Bob, are not. They don't see the babies anyway, so they just right. see. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Some people, not all of us, like babies. We'll share some pictures shortly that'll show why not all of us like screaming babies, but, but yeah, these are great numbers. And then the other thing that's exciting, you know, this transition phase to having, having COVID be just endemic and, and what that looks like, it's going to be uncomfortable for all of us. And I know Dr. Bob, I heard you say, you know, keep the masks on. I think everyone is still keeping masks on in your clinics. And we just appreciate that. We know your patients do not like that you are doing that. Um, and that your fight. So please just know every every time you get in one of those arguments, we really stand behind you and your patients who have immunocompromised conditions, who have infants, who are pregnant, who, who have a, a next door neighbor who has cancer or who they sit with on Sunday afternoons. I really appreciate that you are doing that because there are many of us who are still continuing to to live our lives a little bit different, to try and stay free from COVID. So, but another exciting thing that happens um, as we transition into this like endemic kind of phase is we get to treat COVID like any other darn vaccine. Uh, and as we do that, we know that, that you know, adherence actually increases. So we're curious, if you are screening for COVID vaccines at your well visit. So when you get a, a patient come in, we know typically you would look at ACEs, you would look at the EMR to see what are they due for. Do you check to see ACEs if they're due for it? And I'm gonna give 
we assume a lot of you are not doing that. So would love to give a prize to anyone who can share us with us why you've chosen not to yet. Is it that you just haven't thought to do it yet? You don't have staff, you're not doing new practice changes. Anyone brave enough to tell us why you why you are not yet? Oh, Zachary gets a prize. We try to, but ACES isn't always up to date. Yes, that's been a, um, hopefully that's better with COVID, but it's always a challenge with provider offices, you know, the data doesn't dump and then they're always, ACES is always working to improve those things. So Zachary will get a prize. Uh, Denise says they're not offering COVID vaccine yet. Um, would love to know why. Purchase of a freezer. Oh, Sylvia's waiting on the, free. remember we don't need ultra cold freezers anymore. So if you have any um, questions about that, let us know. We can, we can send you some information about storage and handling. A lot of people don't realize that. We do not need ultra cold. Uh, provider choice, yeah, I'm not surprised some providers are just choosing to not talk about it yet. Um, hopefully as we adjust over, um, the next year to this new life, um, we'll be we'll be willing to to have to have those discussions again. But I completely get just needing to check out of that for a little while. I think we all do. Um, everyone's been pushed to the max. So, um, oh, good. So Rose says it looks like maybe you don't have the vaccine, but you are screening and talking to them and sending them places where they could, that is wonderful. And most of you are screening, which is great. Well, we're excited to go into the world where this is just any other vaccine. And check for those of you in your chat, check, keep your chats open because um, Laura Smith from Tappy was gonna be contacting you for your addresses for your prizes. Um, yeah, a lot of the storage and handling for COVID vaccine have gotten a lot easier, just so you all know. And actually next month, we're going to go over cold chain. So maybe, Macrina, we can plan to do a little overview of, of Pfizer now because uh, we, we continue to see some people think that it's, it's really a lot to store it um, when it's a lot of those difficult things have been uh, changed due to the data. Lack of space, yeah. Cool. All right, so today, thank you all for all that chat and Dr. Bob for your words of encouragement. Um, we're happy that you are new ED um, and can bring us through all of these crazy transitions. So uh, he's certainly not new to vaccines, so. Uh, so we're going to talk about administering vaccines today. So you have had that discussion with your families. They've, you've gotten the yes. You've gone to the fridge. You draw up the vaccine. You have your other MA double check that it's the right vaccine, the right dose for the right patient. Uh, you wash your darn hands a lot throughout that whole process. You go into the exam room. Now we get to actually save the life and administer the vaccine. So one of the most important things to do and to think about when you're administering vaccines is you do not want to poke yourself, right? Proper administration techniques helps prevent errors and that is an incredibly important thing. Uh, we have this video that we found uh, from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where Dr. Paul Offit lives, who is a pediatrician celebrity and vaccine celebrity. And it's actually intended for parents, but we thought it was so good. We wanted to share it with you. So we're going to go ahead and share it and we'll pause it kind of intermittently to uh, the first chunk here. It's going to talk about how parents should prepare their their kids uh, for the vaccine visit. But we think there might be some cool takeaways for you, too. Hello. I'm Dr. Lisa Biggs. As part of your Children's Hospital of Philadelphia primary care team, I know that going to the doctor's office can be overwhelming for patients and caregivers. 
We strongly believe that vaccinations prevent children from getting sick. However, the experience of receiving them can be extremely stressful. Comfort positioning is one way to decrease the amount of stress that a child may experience during vaccines. Comfort positions are secure hugging holds used to provide a nurturing and safe environment for patients, caregivers, and clinicians. This video offers guidance on several comfort positions that are recommended for newborns, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Older children and adolescents may also benefit from a secure hold during a procedure. Please talk with your healthcare team about the best position for you and your child. Comfort positions are hugging holds that help your child feel safe and secure during medical procedures. When your child is able to remain calm and still, it helps to prevent anyone from being injured during the procedure. Since your child feels safest with you, we welcome you to partner with us to reduce your child's stress during vaccines. It is important to create a calm, positive atmosphere. The fewer people in the room, the better. It also helps to have only one person talking to your child at a time so he does not get confused or overwhelmed. It can be difficult to be the one giving vaccinations. Children may see that person as the bad guy. If that happens with your child, please redirect him. Teach him that we are all just helping him to be healthy. This will help your child learn to build a trusting relationship with his healthcare team. Some children think that they are getting a vaccination because they were bad. Please help us to assure your child that vaccines are not a punishment. That I have heard parents do. Have you all heard parents say that? That's annoying when they're like, well, I told you that if you didn't clean your room, this was what was going to happen to you. But did, did you run into that still, Macrina? Um, my favorite is when they, they look at them right there in front of me and say, see, I told you if you weren't good in the waiting room, I, you were going to get a shot. Yeah, they're not helping. Do you correct the parent in that or kind of pull them aside after? Usually what I say is, you know, you should always listen to your mom when you're in the waiting room, but but I'm here to make sure you stay healthy. Good. So redirect. No, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to argue with the parent or set them up, but there's a way to say it so that, you know, hopefully the child doesn't think you're the bad guy and you're supporting mom or dad. Or grandma. Well, the first thing they said in the video was as few people as possible in the exam room. And I thought maybe in Philly they come as in, in dyads, but not in Arizona. We bring everybody to our visits. So, uh, but if everybody is on the same page, you know, that's something too. So as long as everyone knows that we're going to stay calm, a good way to coach. But okay, so let's go into watching how different comfort holds. Ideas for comfort holds. Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Biggs. Oh. As part of your children's hospital of Philadelphia used to benefit anyone from being injured during the procedure. It is important to create a calm, positive atmosphere. The if that happens with your child, please redirect him teach him that we are all just helping him to be healthy. For a preschooler or young school-aged child, the side-sitting position works well. In this position, your child can easily choose to watch or look away while receiving vaccines. This child is wrapping her arm around the back of her mother like a hug. Her mother is making sure to use her own elbow to secure her daughter's arm and to prevent it from reaching out. If your preschooler or young school-aged child is anxious or unpredictable, try tucking his legs in between yours while in the side-sitting position. Another common position for this age group is sitting on a caregiver's lap facing out. This is called a back-to-chest position. This caregiver is securing his son's arms and legs with his own arms and legs. 
You may also choose to use a chest-to-chest -chest position for your child's vaccines. This mother is standing and securely hugging her daughter who is sitting on the exam table. In addition to comfort positioning, distraction, preparation and pain management may also help to reduce the amount of stress your child experiences at the doctor's office. Sometimes I'm comfortable because it feels like you're giving up control and that that parent's not going to give that tight hug for as long as they need to. Part of it is just explaining to the parent to keep that tight hug going until I say, okay, we're done. Um, and so that's just really important to give some um, um, education ahead of time that they just hold on until we're done. Um, and the other is, is a lot of time parents, if a child wants to scream or cry, they want to put their hand over their mouth. Um, it's okay. I'm sure all of us have lost some hearing and I'm sure all of us are very um, used to hearing crying, screaming, whimpering. So um, that's okay. They don't need to put their hand over the child's mouth. There's a... There's some great tips that they have next around how to distract, um, like how parents can distract their children. But one of the things that I thought was is really interesting that you'll hear is, you know, don't lie, like distract your kid, but don't make them think that this isn't going on. And I, I just think that that's powerful, especially for children who we're always trying to teach how to take control of their own healthcare decisions and be part of um, healthcare choices. So I, that's something to just kind of listen for, which was something I hadn't thought of previously. But in addition to comfort positioning, distraction, preparation, and pain management may also help to reduce the amount of stress your child experiences at the doctor's office. Distraction is used to help your child focus on something pleasant rather than something uncomfortable or scary. Distraction should never be used to trick your child. Things like singing, counting, blowing pinwheels, or playing I Spy together often help distract children for the short amount of time that it takes to get the vaccines. Help your child choose something that will comfort him during his visit to the doctor. This will increase his sense of control and confidence. For some, this could mean bringing a comfort item from home, such as a favorite stuffed animal, doll, or blanket. For others, simply sitting on a caregiver's lap is reassuring. While some children like to look away during vaccines, many choose to watch. Either is appropriate and will depend on how your child copes. If a child prefers to watch, allow him to do so. This will build trust and increase his sense of control over the situation. As children grow more curious and independent, they may begin to ask questions about what will happen at the doctor's office. Like adults, children deserve honest answers about their health care. Consider teaching your child before his appointment about why vaccines are important. This information can be difficult for a child to understand, but hearing it ahead of time in a safe place from someone he trusts is helpful. Explain to your child that his job is to hold still and hug you. Offer choices whenever possible by asking what would help him hold still during the vaccines. This will help to give your child a sense of control. During vaccinations, some children react by kicking and wiggling their arms and legs. This can lead to unnecessary needle sticks for you, your child, or a staff member. If it is too difficult for you to hold your child still in a comfort position, an extra staff member may assist you. Preparation, comfort positioning, and distraction can help reduce fear and anxiety before and during vaccines. A device that uses vibration and ice can reduce pain or discomfort associated with vaccines. Talk with your health care team about your child's pain management options. When the vaccines are complete, give your child lots of positive praise. Acknowledge that needles hurt, but focus more on the positives. 
Praise your child for specific behaviors such as holding still or taking big breaths. Never apologize for giving a vaccine, but let him know how proud you are of him. Remind him that we need vaccines to keep us healthy. We hope you find these. I like that they said some children will kick and scream. Because I think a lot of children will kick and scream. They don't all sit smiling in their comfort hold. Well, Jessica made a very good point that teenagers and adolescents are sometimes harder than that five-year-old. And with all the adults I've administered vaccines to in the last um, couple of years, I'm telling you, adults are not a walk in the park either. <laughs> Do they kick and scream? Oh, and they need a lot of distraction. Well, I, Macrina, I, Macrina's given me a few vaccines in my life. And I can't believe that some children, I watched that video and thought, some children like to watch it. Don't tell them to look away. I'm like, don't tell them to look away. I can't even watch your draw it up. I can watch people do it to other, you know, I can observe a million well visits, but not if it's going into my arm, but. Well, and I think that's probably one of the things that if parents are very fearful of vaccines, um, sometimes kids are fearful just because they are. Or they'll say statements like, now, mommy doesn't like these, but you'll be okay. Or um, the mom will say, I have to turn away when I see the needle. Um, so we see a lot of times that parents' fears are um, pushed onto the kiddos. Yeah. All right. So I think we, is there any of these that you think that we should review again for these comfort holds? These are great pictures. And it looks like a lot of them are from that video, you know, from the. Yeah. Just remember that if a mom wants to breastfeed during um, immunizations, that's perfectly okay. In fact, it's very comforting to kiddos. Um, they say that it decreases pain um, that the infant will feel. So if moms want to do that, it's perfectly fine. Let them. Mm -hmm. Your child will still be hungry again. Won't always hate, hate vaccines. Uh, so your newborns, those newborns are actually easier you say right those, those newborns are pretty are pretty simple i think the the hardest part with newborns is actually convincing the parents that they're doing the right thing for their kiddos because the last thing they want to do is make their babies cry they spend their entire first you know couple of months at home trying to have them not to cry and then they bring them in and make them cry so right. but it's okay um, I always say that a good, healthy, a good scream and a good cry show that a healthy, healthy baby. And then the toddlers, they get a little bit more difficult. Um, I really do like um, the, the, the um, chest to chest hold um, because that really keeps the, the legs and the, um, the arms in a nice hold. Mm. Um, Jessica's saying sometimes we have to corner them or have their parents drag them out behind the exam exam table. Oh, for teenagers. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that that brings up a good thing, too, that sometimes your parents, for whatever reason, maybe their mom's just not having a great day, um, but they might not be in a space where they can provide a good comfort hold that's going to keep that patient safe and you safe. So never feel like you can't pull in another MA or another nurse or two or three, if that's what you need to keep that patient safe, so. And I think a lot of times parents, if they've had a bad day and this is the last thing they need is having to chase down a child or a child that they can't safely hold on to, you can see parents start to lose their patience. Um, I think that's a time where it's okay to say, you know, let me see if I can find someone else to help hold and you can go ahead and, and stand over here. And, and so that's really helpful. Because it it's a really stressful situation. Mm -hmm. So a couple other positions for mm -hmm. your preschoolers here. Yep. All right. And as Rebecca said, these pictures are older than time. <laughs> At least she hasn't made the joke that they're older than me. So well, Bob's on. I can pick on Bob today. Oh, thank goodness. Um, I, yeah thanks <laughs> yeah well you know what we keep using the same pictures because sub q is sub q so um sub q is going to go in the fatty tissue as the picture shows um it's on the same location whether you're a baby or whether you're an adult then you're going to go with the im again you can give two ims in the same 
deltoids separated by, on the same muscle, separated by one to two inches are gonna go in a 90 degree angle. Um, for those of us who are older than dirt, as Rebecca likes to say, we do not need to aspirate anymore. I think that was the hardest thing for me to learn not to do. Chubby little legs. Yeah, there's that chubby little legs. They're just so nice when you see those chubby little muscular legs come in. Um, it's going to go there in the vastus lateralis, right there in um, the middle. And then three years and up, you're going to go ahead and go in that deltoid. And then, and we have a, a video that uh, just a two minute video that I'll give some tips. I think Kristen gives some tips there on finding that deltoid. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, our subcutaneous vaccines are our MMR, varicella, and polio. And everything else we administer is given intramuscularly as well as the COVID-19. This is something that only that Maricopa County uses. It's just a process where we have certain vaccines that go on the left, we have certain vaccines that go on the right. It's just one of those other pieces and tools we use um, to decrease risk of error. And again, this is just a guideline. It's not a rule, it's not a policy. This is not ACIP or CDC um, recommended. We just use it. But keep in mind, if you have a kiddo, if you have a, a five-year-old who's getting ready for his kindergarten vaccine and they need a ProQuad and a um, DTAP IPV, if you've got that child held really well after chasing him around the exam room, pulling them out from under the exam table um, and finally get a really good hug and hold onto him, you can give all those vaccines in the same arm. Don't risk trying to move them around again. Um, so again, this is just really guidelines. Right. And I think a lot of practices, this is one of those tools that we show in tips and a lot of people really, really like it because it does help reduce error. And uh, we hear from practices that when everyone's doing it the, kind of the same way, it makes your onboarding and your training easier. So if you're a practice that um, tends to get a lot of um, new MAs all the time, especially, uh, you might want to think about talking to Macrina about kind of pros and cons of doing something like this. So uh, Lorraine's asking, explain PCV15. Is that, is that the... Oh, so PCV15 is the pneumococcal 15 that is for adults currently. Um, and so you're going to give PCV15 to an adult, um, older adult. There are a lot of high risk categories um, where you can administer PCV15. And then you're going to follow it by pneumococcal 23 a year later. Is there a, don't we have an algorithm workflow or something for that? We have, we have something written down for yes, that. Yes, we have an algorithm for that, but the, I think, the, I don't know if it's been updated or not. I know the old algorithm uses PCV7 and the new Okay. Code. This is going to be PCV15. So we will be sure to record next tips to dig something out or have uh, Dr. Lewis, if, if it's something she needs to do for us, our immunization program. Um, Dr. Lewis, the queen of vaccines in Arizona, so. Uh, okay, this baby looks like a crying one, but that's a good one for oral. Yep, yep, that's exactly what you do. Um, and remember, when they're crying, they got a lot of saliva. So if they spit a little bit up, they still got the vaccine. You don't need to repeat it. Um, and definitely hold them up like that. Okay, this is um, flu mist. This is the perfect picture. You do not need to stick that all the way up into the um nose there you're just going to go in just that much and just a squirt on each side it is not afrin no nor is it a covid test <laughs> okay so here's a, a brief video from uh kristen hi i'm kristen park public health nurse with the maricopa county department of public health and today we'll be doing a quick overview on how to give an eye injection First, we'll review the process using a pre-filled syringe and a safety glide needle, and end with reviewing the same process using a vantage point retractable syringe. Let's begin. Hi Jenny, how are you? First, identify your patient and explain what vaccine will be given and which type of injection will be done. If it's within your scope of work, 
screen for contraindications, and verify that your patient has received a vaccine information statement and has had time to review it and ask questions. Perform proper hand hygiene prior to preparing the vaccine. Gather the appropriate supplies, including the correct needle length and gauge, sterile alcohol, and bandage. Verify that you are removing the correct vaccine from the box and check the expiration on the syringe. Pick up the pre-filled syringe and make sure there is no discoloration or precipitate. Next, remove the needle from its packaging. Be careful not to touch the hub of the needle. Hold the needle by its protective cap and attach it by twisting it onto the tip of the syringe. Remove the small amount of air in the syringe and recheck the expiration date and vaccine. For an IM injection, the deltoid muscle is the preferred site for adults. Identify your injection site by having the patient relax their arm. To locate the landmark for the deltoid muscle, expose the upper arm and find the acromion process by palpating the bony prominence. The injection site is above the level of the armpit and approximately one to two inches below the acromion process. Now, clean the area with alcohol and allow the site to completely dry. Control the limb with a non-dominant hand. With a dominant hand, inject the needle quickly into the muscle at a 90 degree angle. Inject the vaccine using steady pressure and withdraw the needle at the angle of insertion. Make sure to activate the safety shield immediately after removing it from the patient. It's important to activate the safety shield away from self and others. Finally, after properly disposing the needle and syringe in the sharps container, you can apply a bandage, perform hand hygiene, and remember to document injection site and procedure per policy. All right, so we just did the, the pre-filled syringe there because that's the, the most common one for adults, but that's it's a great video. Um, I love that the her shirt looked to be pretty loose, but remember, if it's a tight shirt, you don't, you want them to remove them, remove their arm from it, right? Make sure you remove, make sure you actually make a move, remove the arm. If it's too tight, if you can't get to the right spot, um, it's just, it's gonna hurt more. Um, it's not gonna be administered appropriately. So when people start to say, I don't wanna take my shirt off, I don't take my sleeve out of my shirt. Um, I just usually say, well, it's for their safety and their protection. I wanna make sure the vaccine's given appropriately so it works the way it's supposed to work. And I wanna make sure that you don't have any um, extra soreness or, or steer arm. All right, so managing reactions. What are the, there's three different kinds. So there's localized and systemic, which is the two I'm gonna talk about first. I think the best thing to do is just to go ahead and explain to parents what to expect. I mean, you're gonna expect a little fever, maybe a little malaise, not feeling 100%. My grandma used to say, you're gonna feel a little punk. Um, or you might have some soreness or itching or swelling at the side. Um, might have a little bruising sometimes. Just tell parents what to expect and what's normal reactions. Um, I think all of us are doing a much better job at that after we got our second COVID vaccine and felt extremely punk, as my grandma would say. Um, but my grandma always used to say, well, if you feel a little punk after the vaccines, it means it's your body reacting and it's building an immune response. And that's a good thing. It took um, good. It's a good thing. And then some psychological, some fright, some syncope. The majority of our teenagers, it's not a reaction for them passing out. Well, it is, it's an emotional reaction. Um, it's those adolescents who haven't eaten anything all day and come in right after school for vaccines. Um, or it's those who haven't drank any water all day and it's 120 degrees outside and they're slightly dehydrated. So those are some good questions to ask, especially your adolescents and teenagers. When was the last time you had anything to drink or you eaten anything? And we all, all of us have been doing this for a long time. We know what a teenager that is gonna pass out looks like before they even walk in the exam room. <laughs> um, we saw so much with the COVID vaccine of the cycle, you know, people were it, having anxiety attacks. And then- I think and, a lot of it was panic attacks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so VARES, if you do ha see an adverse reaction, so something that really should not have been happening, then you will do your report to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Remember, anybody can make a report to VARES. So you can, um, your patient can, their parents can, anybody can make a report. What this, there's no bad data that can go in there because the whole point of VARES is to collect as much as possible 
uh, so that they can do surveillance and look at vaccine safety. It looks at trend data. There's lots of other types of federal monitoring programs that look at safety as well. Uh, but theirs looks at everything, and this is where they're going to identify possible risks associated with vaccines. So we've now given tens of millions of this type of vaccine, and we see that there's a lot of syncope, or we see that there's a lot of, you know, a few amount of people who've had this type of health condition afterwards or made this report. So. Yeah, and it's really important. It doesn't matter. If you don't know, go ahead and report it. Yeah. Um, the folks at Bears, they'll weed through all of that. And if you have a patient who, who calls you and says, you know, this was an adverse event and you know it was not an adverse event, it was actually um, a typical or something that you would expect, like a very sore arm or feeling really punk after your Shingrix vaccine and not being able to uh, go to happy hour that night, which is what happened to poor McCree. Actually, I think you, when you got Shingrix, you were able to do the happy hour, not the cleaning. Correct. But My yeah. was to clean the pantry. I was too sick to clean the pantry, but I wasn't sick enough not to go to happy hour. Yeah. So again, that's uh, pretty much, yes. But if you, if you feel like a patient is saying, telling you something happened that they think was adverse and it wasn't, please correct that information. You know, tell them that is typical, but if you are worried, you can feel free to report to bears. So you don't have to report it, but you can tell them to. Mm -hmm. um, we have another poll here. We're just curious to see if you have ever seen an adverse reaction. So I'm gonna launch that. And Macrina, what an adverse reaction is something really out of the ordinary, right? Right, and adver it's, it's something out of the ordinary. It's it's uh, like that arm you saw, it's something that's an arm that is swollen, red, hot, it gets getting larger, that's an adverse reaction. Anything that requires an emergency room, urgent care, doctor's visit um, is gonna be considered an adverse event unless there's another reason for it. Um, and we'd love to hear, it looks like as the poll questions are coming in, there are people saying, yes, they have seen a reaction. If you could unmute yourself and tell us or just chat it in, because uh, we're curious to hear what it is. I think when we were doing all those big COVID, COVID clinics, Macrina, that was a really big thing for a lot of, even our medical volunteers and folks to say, if we're not transporting them to an ER, you know, it's probably something that would be expected. That was a good kind of, frame of reference, I think. Have mm -hmm. you ever seen an adverse reaction? Um, you know what? I saw one years ago when we were giving whole cell pertussis, the old fashioned DTP, we would see a lot of, of severe of reactions that required ED and, um, and hospital visits and, and doctor's visits. But since then, I really haven't seen anything significant. And you give vaccines like a lot. That's we all. A lot of, we give a lot of vaccines, and very seldom do we see anything that's that's out of the norm. Out of all the years that I've been working, decades, um, I've seen maybe one or two, and it's just the that redness, swelling, um, hot feeling, and the provider just saw the patient and they were fine. That's all I've had. But I've been doing this for. 20 plus years, so not very many. Thanks, Arissa. Yeah, I think that it is very rare. Um, I mean, you figure we always say it's one in a million, you know, one in a million are gonna have an adverse reaction. So um, you're, you're gonna be working in clinics that, that see million of people. Red swollen with a bump, is that an adverse reaction? Or would that be typical? If it's if it's sort of like the size of a of a porter or, or something, then it's probably normal. If it's something that continues to get bigger over time, then it's not normal. Um, it's it's really hard to say um, either or. It's not really black or white. Um, mm -hmm. You really just need to get a description of it. And yeah, I think that the it's just it's. I think we're coming with COVID because we had such strong immune responses. Our so, so many individuals had such a strong immune response. 
hopefully we're getting a lot better at explaining to patients and to our families what a typical immune response is, that a really sore arm is normal, that's your immune system working, recognizing that, you know, um, maybe a little bit of swelling or a swollen lymph node, you know, those things are to be expected. So maybe um, if we're really looking glass half full, uh, we we will start to be able to see what what a true you know adverse thing is a little bit better and not spend time looking through um, you know mining through data of things that are to be expected. So, all right, documentation. What do you have to write in the chart? It looks like everything. Um, so I think if you remember everything, then I think. Um, you're not going to miss anything. You need the date it's administered, the manufacturer lot number, um, along with expiration date, the date the VIS was provided, as well as the VIS addition date, um, the name of the person and title who administered it, um, the address of the facility, um, the route, the site, and um, the dosage or volume. And expiration, yeah. And expiration. most of your EMRs will have all of this. Actually, most of your EMRs are going to have everything you have. You need in yeah. And we also want to make sure that you always document whether a patient refuses the vaccine. So you're going to document that in the chart, but you can also document that in ACEs too, right? I don't think you can document refusal. Oh, we're not doing that. In okay. ACEs, no. Oh, I'm wrong. The first time this year, Macrina. Okay. Just kidding. The first time ever this year you've been on that. <laughs> you know, we can't, we, we can't um, document it in ACES, but it's, okay. you, it is really important that you document that somewhere. Um, I think the refusal form actually, first of all, is to protect you and your provider to, um, to say that you made the offer, you set the education, and that they refused. But I think also that refusal form and documenting it and actually having the parents sign um, kind of drives home the point that it's their choice, that you provided all the education, you provided the risks and the benefits of both vaccine and disease, and that they have made the choice not to immunize. And sometimes when you have parents sign and say it's um, your choice, then sometimes they'll kind of change, they'll rethink it and change their mind a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and AAP has a um, has a refusal form that they've circulated, and there's others. Um, if anybody has one that you use that you think is really good and has helped provide that education to parents, please send it to us because we'd love to send it. We do get asked for these um, once in a while. And remember, oh, go ahead. One thing, one thing, just just remember that if you put the refusal under the exception um, exemption for personal reasons in the um, in ACES that only the provider that entered the accept, the exemption can actually remove it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Which for, for those that are medical homes that, you right. know, that's perfectly appropriate, you know. Um, do remember to not, you know, always tell the provider if that patient refused. Always remember to tell the provider because we know that that interaction with the physician or the nurse practitioner is can be really powerful. Um, and and they'll most you know your good providers will spend the extra time uh, to answer any questions that that family has. So make sure that you tell them. Um, it is such a team sport, vaccines. So you have a role in convincing and empowering those families uh, and helping give them the inf right information. So do your providers. We have Donna Furlong as a member of our team. Uh, she is the nurse at, at Banner Health and has done a lot of these TIPS uh, events in the past, especially in Coconino County, uh, Navajo and Apache County. Uh, now she's with Banner down in, in, here in Phoenix, but she recently got published uh, by the American Academy of Ambulatory Care Nursing. So we just wanted to, um, we put the link to the article in your chat, but we wanted to say congratulations to Donna and hope that you all read this because I think that um, it does go to show just the role of the whole team. And she's using HPV as, a, as an example, but it's just, 
a really great article and we love you donna so congrats all right well we will keep the line open for a little a couple minutes like we always do in case you have any other kinds of questions that you uh that you would like to ask i think our next tips is june um 16th 16th uh we're going to go over cold chain um and enjoy your enjoy your may we'll see you all in flagstaff soon because it's getting real hot down here in phoenix so we'll we'll be clogging your roads in no time don't you worry about it thank you all so much and i'm digging through the chat macarena to see if we missed will five to eleven boosters be the same dose oh Ooh. Good question. That's an excellent question. Can't can't answer that yet until the advisory committees weigh in. Mm -hmm. I don't know what data. I don't know what the data was that they submitted, whether it was a half dose or a whole dose. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, we're we're gonna have to make sure we. Um, <laughs> there was, send that out as soon as it hits send it to all the providers and then just add the tech tips add this list too um uh do you want to talk about freezers macrina they don't need any of that you do not need an ultra cold freezer anymore um, well, only if you want to store it for a longer period of time right so there was there was a there was a question earlier about the minimum order size um, for the gray caps still being 300 doses and a perception that that's uh, discouraging some from ordering because they, they can only keep it for 10 weeks. That's why I plopped into there the, the vaccine sharing yeah. site because that's at least one way around it. But also, you know, some if, if a county, you guys don't split up orders for providers anymore at Maricopa, do you? No, we don't. Yeah, it it might actually work better with smaller counties um, if if they wanted to be in that business and if they had a deep freezer, then they could order larger quantities and keep it longer. I think some like some of the counties didn't before we were breaking them into smaller ones. They had never ordered were were never able to order Pfizer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we broke it down when it was the minimum of mm -hmm. doses, but yeah, but well, way, we it don't was even... need, you can order smaller amounts now from right through ACES and you don't, you can put it in your regular unit. Yeah, yeah but you still have to keep, you still have minimum order sizes through ACES. And, and the questioner was right, the, the gray cap, it's still at 300 doses and so I, yeah and I, it's the five so, to eleven it's really uncomfortable for offices to order things when you know you're going to have to throw away you know you're not going to be able to use it but right. please know that this will not hit your vfc uh report cards you cdc has been very consistent about not wasting an arm if they if you have someone in front of you that wants a covid vaccine they want you um, to be offering it in your practices so that you we don't m miss any of these opportunities. So uh, I know it goes like against everything in your being to order vaccine that you know you're not going to be able to use. But remember, you will be able to try and find another provider office that can do it on the link Dr. Bob shared. And we really need you carrying this vaccine in your office. There's a question about can you still use ultra cold freezer? Yeah, it varies yes. by the by the vaccine type, but it allows you to store it for longer periods, and it's specific to each vaccine. Um, it'll it'll tell you in the storage and handling, and all of that's available. There are uh, um, shorthand um, descriptions of that available on the EDHS site where you go to. Um, find out about each vaccine. 
Uh, there's one on here, Macrina. What's the process for giving vaccines when they don't have the record? Do you just base it off of ACEs? Um, if they don't have the record and there's no record into ACEs, then um, we just try to get as much information as we can and administer based on what we can what we can get. If they have no record and they can't remember anything, they're immunizers if they haven't had anything. Um, just move forward with the um, with the best information you can you can get. You can always call a school to get information. If they have it, you can call the school from another state. Um, you can actually call a state and they may be able to look it up in the registry for you. Um, there's, there's a lot of creative ways to find some information. And if they don't have the card, do, they do, don't have do the any card. families show up with their <laughs> you know what is amazing is I have to honestly say that we see a lot of folks who show up um, with immunization records. Um, we see a lot of our folks who are coming from South America who show up with immunization records. Um, they flee, you know, they, they flee their areas and those immunization records are really important. Vaccines are very valuable to them and we see them showing up all the time. Wow. Um, yeah, we have a lot of people that depend on ACEs. Oh, uh, thank you, Jennifer, for finding that. Um, oh, thank you. Storage and handling site. Can you document a COVID vaccine given by another provider in ACES? Yes, you just document it as historical. Um, you can't enter the lot for expiration date or anything, but you can enter it as a historical vaccine. which we have done for a lot of folks who have received um, COVID vaccines from other states, COVID vaccines from other countries. All right. Anything else? That may be uh, Owen. Uh, oh, but on the card. So, so she's saying someone from VFC said they can't write the historical date on the CDC card. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I would, if a patient, I would send them to my IR and get their record. Yeah. yeah. Or have them contact ADHS and get their record or print it. Yeah, print it yourself uh, if you have it in ACES. Yeah, I wouldn't, You, it's, if they need the documentation uh, that they received the vaccine for travel or for employment or, you know, any other reason, you can get that from ACES. Yep. They can get that from ACES. You can decide to help them or not depending on how busy you are that day. Uh, if a patient came in with a lost card. Right, if they came in with a lost card and they wanted it back on the card and we had time, I mean, we would go ahead and just go into ACES if we documented on the card. If you administered it, but would you do it if? Sure, if I could, if I could pull up the lot number and expiration date and Dr. Bob and- Oh, I see. I would go ahead and write it on a card. A lot of it has to do with whether or not we have time in a busy clinic day to be able to do that for folks. But if we have the time, yeah, we can do that. Because you have all the information in ACES. Right, yeah, well, you have all the information in ACES. They might be right that on the actual card, but I can't see the harm that would be done if you did it your way. Yeah, if, if you pull it up in ACES, the problem with a lot of folks is they, for places like um, travel and some places they need the lot number and the expiration date as well. Right, the manufacturer. right. And when you print up the record from ACES, all you get is that very long six inch definition of, of SARS-CoV-2 mRNA, a lot of numbers, doses one, two, or three, or whatever, you don't get Moderna or Pfizer 
the exp lot number expiration date when you print the record. So in some instances, you have to do that for patients if they've lost the record or else they won't have the documentation they need. There you go. My IR is great, but it has some, it has a few, you have to jump, you have to make sure that everything matches up, your cell phone, your name, an address, and sometimes that always doesn't work. I mean, we, we may get in trouble for recommending something that's not technically correct, but I like what Tomasita just wrote in the chat box about what she does. I mean, from a patient care standpoint, mm -hmm. I, think, I like that. Oh, that's a good idea. That adds some importance to that immunization record now, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, that's a great. Oh, yeah. Thank, remind me. Added. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, if, if you got a smartphone, take a picture of your card. Yeah. We have a, a neighborhood restaurant that requires you. They still never opened up their the dining room area, but they are now letting us go in there if you have to use the restroom, but you have to show your a picture of your vaccine card yeah okay all right guys well thank um, you everybody thank you.